2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All of scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Amen. You may be seated and return back to James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. There was a young boy who was very, very bright. He picked up things quickly, readily, and easily. And as he grew more, he was ahead of most of his other kids his age. Uh, he was just gifted in that he had a mind, he had a photographic memory, and he could remember things, and he could recall things, and he just seemed to be on a higher level intellectually. But as he grew, not only did he grow in knowledge, but also he grew in pride. And in growing in pride, he stressed contempt for others who didn't seem to know what he did. The sad reality when he related to people he came across as a know-it-all. Because <laughs> he thought he knew it all, amen. Because he was blessed, but his blessing became a curse. Because all of his friends, our so-called friends, no longer want to be around him because they really couldn't stand him because of his attitude toward them. That's a sad way to be, amen, church? To be someone who no one wants to be around. Let it not be said that of any Christian. While for us as Christians, we don't profess to know it all. But we do profess to know something that is true. And in our text today, from James chapter 3, Verses 13 to 18, James wants us to know some things. He wants us to have what is described as wisdom. Now, wisdom is different than just knowledge. Wisdom is really the ability to, to navigate life in a way that is according to God's word. It is a way according to God's word, and it is more than just it's more than just knowing it, it is knowing how to use the truths that you have. And you see, one of the things that was critical, the book of James is one of the earliest epistles written. And James has a lot in his book that he is seeking to impress upon his hearers. James is zealous for Shoe leather Christianity. James is zealous because you know that his brother was Jesus. And because Jesus was his brother at one time, he did not believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. But once Jesus, as it says, appeared to him, James became a believer and he became a devout believer. And he became a defending believer. And he became one who, who, who took the teachings that Jesus had and he applied them to his life. And he said, not only should I do that, not only should the apostles do that, those who knew the Lord personally, but everyone should do that. And so at this point in the book of James, where we are, James is talking about some things that should be seen so that we can look at it and see that as people who are coming to know the whole counsel of God, we know how to apply wisdom. As the people coming to know the whole counsel of God, we know 
how to apply wisdom. We can put our hand on three points. These points are not inspired, but they help you with memory. Number one, determine the measure for your conduct. Verses 13 to 14. Secondly, discard, discard, get rid of man-centered conduct. Verses 15 to 16. And then third and finally, dis discover meaningful conduct. Verses 17 through 18. But let's first determine the measure for our conduct. Verses 13 through 14. James says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. So James says here that who among you is wise? Now, it's, it's, it's significant that he asked that question because wisdom is an important topic throughout the Bible. The Bible says that the Lord gives wisdom and out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Throughout history, philosophers have talked about what they call wisdom. Matter of fact, one of the philosophers of history named Cicero said that wisdom is a gift from the gods. That wisdom is a gift from the gods. Now, they didn't necessarily mean the God of the Bible, but they meant it was something from on high, something divine, something not just confined to here on earth. And so, they knew that wisdom was something that you needed to have. And James was saying, who is wise among you? Now, the Bible, as I said, talks about the acquiring the wisdom that comes from God. But for us today, and as those who are at this point in history, we want people to know the most important thing that will determine if you're wise or not. It will help you to conduct yourself in a proper way. Turn, if you will, a few pages to your right, excuse me, to your left, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, which is where we, we bring out, we, we, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, excuse me where we cite the all scripture is given by inspiration of God. But before that, Paul wrote in chapter 3, verse 14 and following, but you, that is in it, must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned it, and that from, a, from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and gives the all scriptures given by the inspiration of God that we cite every Sunday. But he says that the scripture is able to make you wise under salvation. So if, if James asked this question, who is wise? And understanding among you. In other words, who among you? Because remember, the book of James concentrates and, and, and highlights that real faith has to be seen in how we live. Real faith needs to be able to be measured in our conduct. And it says, if you are wise, if you have what it takes, if you have come to know God, if you come to gain true wisdom, it ought to reflect in how you act. It ought to be seen in how you walk. 
It ought to be revealed in how you talk. Because he says, let him show by good conduct. Oh, how do we how do we conduct ourselves, church? How do we as believers conduct ourselves? Oh, it's so important that we live in such a way that people can see the difference that Jesus Christ makes in our life. You see, Jesus Christ came to save us and to make us new in him. The Bible says that we're to be renewed in the spirit of our mind, to be transformed, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when we take God's word and we hear it and we read it and we are exposed to it, it ought to affect us in how we think, how we act, what we focus on. James says, if you have the wisdom of God, it's going to express itself. It's going to express itself in how you live. It's going to be, it's going to affect your attitudes. It's going to affect your conduct. Because notice he says there, let him show by good conduct. So you can measure your conduct to see if you have wisdom. How do you live your life? The challenge is to grow. The challenge is to ask and to see through life's situations, circumstances, and trials. You remember James earlier says that my brothers counted out joy when you go through various trials. Oh, we're going to go through trials in life because he says that the trying of your faith produces patience or endurance. And let that endurance have its perfect work that you might be complete, not lacking anything. You see, we lack a whole lot. Depending on a lot of circumstances in our life, we are not where God wants us to be. And in order for God to get us there, we have to do spiritual exercise. Because we're weak and we need to be strengthened so that we can endure. So God allows certain things to come our way. Now God allows certain problems for us to face. God allows certain people who get under our skin to do so. He allows these things to happen because he has a goal in mind. He has an end result in mind. That end result is that it might help us to see those areas where we need his help, where we need to grow, where we need to think differently, where we need to change, where we, where we need to be transformed, where we need to be like Christ. You see, if you claim you are wise, it'll be seen in how you live. It'll be seen in your conduct. And notice he says, it is good conduct. God does not call any believer to do anything wrong. You know, it is amazing how that so many people, especially today, since today is a day where people call good evil and evil 
good. The God of the Bible, the Bible does not call Christians to live in any way that is bad, does it? God challenges us and calls us to what? First, love Him, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second is like it. When Jesus was explaining what was the greatest commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. That encapsulated the Ten Commandments and all that was written after that for the people of ancient Israel. And so he was saying that if you love God, what are you going to do? You're going to praise him, aren't you? Because you realize that every good and perfect gift is from above. If you love God, you're going to trust him. You're going to say, Lord, I, I, I know you, you're there for me because I, you've expressed the greatest expression of love because, number one, you came and died for me. So you expressed the greatest expression of love that you, you took my sins upon you. And then, Lord, I, 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 I love you because of all that you give. You give me what I need, not just what I want, but but I can pray and I can and I will receive from you and you will supply my needs, not my wants. You supply my needs and then even when it, when it seems like what I want is not what I need, you'll give me the grace to, to bear with that. So the trial that I'm going through has a purpose. It is a purpose to make me love you and, and to love my neighbors so, so I, I, I love my family, I love my spouse, I love my children, I love my boss, I love my people, my neighborhood, and I treat them right. I'm a good citizen. I give my best when I work, whenever my hands find to do, do hard to the Lord. I cooperate, as we see later, it talks about being harvest is a peace. Oh, it makes a difference. That good conduct. And so when we go through the trials of life, it might show us that we have impatience that we need to learn to grow from. Don't pray, don't pray for patience, though, because that's one of the worst prayers you can pray. Because if you pray for patience, you can ask them for a boat below the trial. So don't pray for patience. <laughs> Just say, Lord, give me wisdom. <laughs> give me wisdom, amen. Give me wisdom, Lord. And so, but this these trials we go through are to show us where we're weak, cause us to exercise in God and go stronger so we can endure. So the next time something like that comes around, we're better able to handle it. It won't knock us down. It won't knock us out. It will show us and the world who the real God is. That he is, that he is able. And that he enables his children by good conduct. That what we see, that what people see in our life ought to reflect God and who he is. And he says you do that in meekness of wisdom. Meekness means humility. God cannot use arrogant people. And that's why God often brings things in our life to humble us. Because the, the Bible does not the Bible say you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will exalt you and do on the proper time. And when you do that, you can pass. All your cares on him, isn't that what First Peter 5 says? We can cast all our cares on him because he cares for us because we are humble ourselves before him. Oh, this humility is important. If you want to be wise, you've got to be humble. You cannot be there. The Bible says in the Old Testament, in the prophets, wise will hear and increase in learning. 
we have to be teaching. We can't be like the boy, the boy who was a know it all. Amen? Because we don't know it all. But God does. He knows it all. But notice that it says, but if you have bitter, envy, and self-seeking in your hearts, that's not the right conduct. You're not measuring that right. Do not lie and boast against the truth. In other words, he said, if you have bitter envy, that idea there is, is it is a resentful attitude toward others. Now, why would people get resentful toward others? Because they're jealous, amen? Christians should never be jealous, number one, because when you're jealous of someone or something or whatever it is, you're saying, you're saying that God don't know what he's doing. Because you're mad that they have something that you don't have. And you're saying that God is unjust toward you for not giving you that when you have that attitude. But you see, that is the attitude of the world, isn't it? The attitude of the world is, you know, people will come and they will smile and they will laugh and talk in your face one way. But then they might go behind your back and do everything that underlines you, everything that stabs you in the back. No believer should be that way. But there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who are that way. They have, it notice it says, Bitter in me. That idea of bitter was is something that is defiled or uh, a, 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 a liquid or something that you, you could not drink. It's tainting. It, that in you, uh, bitterness, it taints. It, it, it infects, makes bad. And then it says self-seeking in your heart. In other words, self-promoting or someone who's antagonistic toward others because of the fact that they would want to have or be what that person is. You see, that is the natural way of living. It's a dog eat dog world, amen? You get yours. You get yours before they get theirs. And if you have to run through them to get yours, go ahead and get it. Because then you got yours, amen? As long as you are happy, that's all that matters. But you see, the believer is not that way. You see, our conduct is measured by wisdom. We are wise and we have good conduct. We reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have words of kindness. And so we have thoughts of goodness. So we have expressions of love. So we have attitudes toward others that is welcoming and loving because it's not us. It is God who is working in and through us as Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says, the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit and it governs us to be born in the spirit. In other words, I'm under the control of the spirit of God over the church. Are you wise? Do you have salvation? And do you have this expression? You see, salvation has a beginning, an initiation, but then it has a reality, or authentication, authentication, a realization. It is lived out in the conduct. And that's what James is saying. And he says, if you don't have that, you are boasting and lying against the truth. In other words, the truth is this. If you claim to know God, but you don't act like it, something is wrong. You need to do a serious examination. You're lying against the truth because the truth of God is this. If any man were what our girl be in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. They are able to walk, as Ephesians says, in newness life. 
they're transformed. They have to see it initially, but you will see it working incrementally. God will be working, as I said, through those trials. Oh, church, well, how's your conduct? Don't, don't lie against the truth. Just say, Lord, where am I? Where am I lacking? Lord, I want to measure my conduct to make sure I'm wise and understanding, to make sure that I have good conduct, to make sure that I'm reflecting Jesus, to make sure that, Lord, as much as I can, I'm just bringing glory and honor to you today. Amen? Amen. But secondly, church, you discard man-centered conduct. Man-centered conduct. Verses 15 and 16. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For when envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Notice that. It says, see, there's a contrast in wisdom, isn't there? There's a wisdom that is from God or above, and there is a wisdom is not from above, but is below. And you see, what we have to understand is that the wisdom that is from above is one that moves us in the proper direction. We are moved to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the wisdom that's from above is in contrast from the wisdom that is below. Because notice there, James says, it is earthly. That is, it is man's wisdom. And you see, the wisdom of this world in no ways endures us to the things of God. The wisdom of this world is that I am the opposite of what God wants. I am self-seeking. I am bitter and have envy. I am only out for myself. I am only concerned about my own and getting my own. I'm, I'm selfish, self-centered, and wanting to have everything to be my way. That is the wisdom that is from below. That is the man-centered wisdom that we must not allow to be in our life. We must discard it. We must allow God to work in our life. And so James draws a contract and he wants us to understand that there are two kinds of wisdom. There are two ways that we could possibly live our life. And there's no, between those two ways, there's no great area between them. It is either from above or below. In chapter 4, James goes on to say, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they come from your desires for pleasure? That war in your members you lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask that you may spend it on your pleasures. You see, the problem of human conflict, the problem of human conflict is lies in the bed of earthly wisdom. The Bible refers to wisdom that is not godly as foolishness. That term for wisdom and foolishness summarizes 
the truth between the two. The difference can be broken down in where they come from. True wisdom comes from God. And therefore, it's from above. In the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, it consistently shows us that true wisdom comes from God. And as a result, as Christians, we believe God's word. Amen? God's word is our, our textbook from which we study. And there is a collection of wisdom that is practical to everyday life. Solomon had a collection of proverbs that gave wisdom for living. And he gave those because he was taught those. And as believers, we have to understand that if we're going to live by wisdom and live by God-centered conduct, we have to discard the old and put on the new. Amen? The Bible says that when we are transformed, we stop being conformed or squeezed into the mold by this world, but we are transformed or metamorphosized by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. You see, we, we demonstrate the will of God by how we live. We see it as we walk with him in our daily life. But the wisdom that is on the earth is the total opposite of the wisdom that is from above. It's confined to this earth. It is says they're sensual and also demonic. It is generated by the forces of evil in this world. And so we have to realize that that line of wisdom, that line of thinking, that line of living does not come from God. And we must discard it. It is the improper way to live. When James says sensual, that word literally can be translated soulish. That word is used in the New Testament to describe that which pertains to our sinful nature. So in other words, if you live in that way, you're living according to your old way of life. And we're living in opposite of what God wants and instead are actually aligning ourselves with, with God's enemy, with Satan and his forces. And so the problem that we face is to understand that when we allow the things in our world, when we allow the philosophy of our world, when we allow the way other people act and do to become the way we act and do, we are following, we are following the devil. We are following evil. And as a result, we cannot see the wisdom of God if we have man-centered conduct. You see, a fool is not someone just short of a couple of bricks or someone who's elevated doesn't go to the top floor. A fool is someone who decides to live life without God. We should factor God in every area of life. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, in the book of Psalms, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now we think that's talking about an atheist, not necessarily. It actually means 
someone who when they conduct their life, they do not consider how God would want them to act. That is a fool. When we conduct our lives and we don't consider how God wants us to act, that is foolishness. And then James says, <clears throat> for where, verse 16, for where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. That's, just, that's significant. Confusion is what we see in our world, don't we? When the way our leaders, the way our people conduct themselves, there is confusion. Because we see the earthly wisdom apply. Just look at our nation and our politics in our nation and the dissension that we see amongst the politicians and the things we see amongst the people, there's hostility. There is antagonism that is uh, just a desire to one-up someone else. But God has not designed us to be those who are self-seeking and envious because out of that, out of that, those attitudes flow all the things that we see that create chaos in our world. It's mental. It's in the mind. The battle that we all face is in the mind. The mind, if we are not focused on the proper things, we will want to do the wrong actions. We will want to be like the wrong people. We will want to follow the wrong examples. And that's what we will do. But God wants something different for us. He wants us to put that off. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that we should put off in Ephesians chapter 4 the conduct of the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful or deceiving lust and put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The right conduct, the wrong lust, the self-seeking lust, the use, manipulate people for our own end, the use them and discard them, to run over them, to gain advantage by them. That is the way of the world. But God says for believers, that should not be seen. That should not characterize the way we live. We should discard man-centered conduct. You know, most people, when they say they like somebody or want to be around them, what they really mean is what you have, I like because it gives me something that I want. It's not, I like you because I can bless you with what I have. I like you because I'm going to give of myself so that you can be benefited or blessed. It is rather, I gave from you something that I want, that I like. It might be your presence, because you might have a presence that's, that's inviting, or it might be your, your appearance. You might have an appearance that is inviting, but it, it, it might be your possession, something that you have that's very inviting. But, but it's not that, because I can give to you something that benefits and blesses you. You see, the self-centered. Is man sinning? Is selfish? Is self seeking? Is envious? I want this for myself. I want this at all costs. I want this, and I don't care about who I have to, who I have to mistreat or use to get what I want, 
Oh, church, that should be in the life of a believer. Our conduct, we want to discard man-centered conduct. And third and finally, we want to discover the meaningful conduct. Meaningful conduct. Look at verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make sweet peace. So the contrast comes twice in this passage when he talks about wisdom. And if you're wise, the wisdom that is above means that in, in what you do, your motives are the proper ones. He says the wisdom that is from above is pure. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In other words, you do the right thing for the right reasons. You do the right things for the right reasons. And that purity speaks of your relationship with God. And the peace speaks of your ability to get along with others. Amen? If you find yourself always in a fight, something obviously not right. <laughs> Amen? The, the first thing to do for people is to make peace with God. Amen? By having faith in Jesus Christ. James lists other qualities that relate to being a lover of peace. And we need to understand those important things. He says, consider, be someone who is peace, Wisdom is from above, is peaceful. And, 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 are, and then gentle. Are you gentle? What does he mean by that? That means it's a hard word to understand, but it means a person who submits to others even when it, it causes difficulty. And they have an attitude of of of, of patience and understanding. And so you are reasonable and you get along as best you can with others. James says that's a sign that the, you have the right kind of conduct. You are the right, going in the right direction. You're gentle. You're willing to yield. You're submissive. You are compliant. You are approachable. You're willing to yield to others. You don't have to always have you don't always have the need to be right or have things to go your way. Then James says, full of mercy. Believers should be compassionate. Jesus was compassionate, wasn't he? The Bible, you remember time, many times Jesus would go somewhere and the Bible would say Jesus was moved with compassion. Amen? Are we moved with compassion? Even if we can't necessarily do anything to change that circumstance, we can always pray. Because when we pray, God hears and answers our prayer. And so we need to be full of mercy. We need to be full of compassion. When we see others who are hurting, we need to be reaching out. That's why James says in chapter 2, verses 15 to 16, uh, that, that if you see somebody in need, and you don't provide, how can you say that the love of God is in you? How can you say you have the right kind of faith if it doesn't make you act? And then he goes on to say, good fruit. Huh. Kind of sounds like a book of Galatians, doesn't it? Because good fruit is what Paul lists in the book of Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, that is spiritual fruit that's in your life. Love, the overarching, guiding uh, fruit. 
joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. They ought to be the good fruit in our life. Then it goes on to say, without partiality, do you treat people the same? Or do you have faith? Oh, church. Oh, we sometimes fail in this area, don't we? But the Bible says we should not be impartial. We should not show favoritism. We should be impartial. We should treat everyone the same. And we should treat them as if they were the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And so, we need to be impartial. Sincere. We need to be true and genuine and honest. Because that's what God is. God is always truthful. God is always good. God always shows us what is right. The Bible makes it clear that whatever we do, we shouldn't allow the wrong attitudes to grow up in our life. Sometimes, as believers, we allow bitterness in our life. Do we have bitterness in our life? Do we have any unresolved anger towards someone, our spouse, our kids, our, our, our brothers and sisters, a friend, a boss? The Bible clearly tells us that we must do whatever it takes to not let bitterness grow in the soil of our life. When people say that we are someone who is true to what we claim, or when they say they can't see what we say we have, how do we acquire this wisdom? The wisdom comes from God. The wisdom comes that when we get into his word every day, when we take the time to meditate on the word of God, when we ask God to show us, Lord, what are you trying to teach through this word? How should I conduct myself in light of what you are saying in these passages? Because notice it says there in, in verse 18, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Notice he says that fruit is sown. Now you don't know it's sown fruit, do you? You sow seed. But he says that what he what he, what is what is what the idea there is the replication. Of the process, it is it is repeated over and over and over and over again, so that there is fruit where you can get other seed, and then so and you will see peace. You will see the evidence of the spirit of God amongst the believers. You see the wisdom of God has to affect every area of our life. As a matter of fact, it is an illustration. If you say that, that you are saved by the grace of God, then you ought to see these things evidence in your life. Because Paul wrote in Titus chapter 2, you can just turn there it's just a few verses over to the left in your Bible. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, listen to what he said. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God that makes you wise and brings salvation from sin has appeared. But it not, it not only has it appear, but it teaches us that denying ungodliness, in other words, contrasting the wisdom of this world, saying no to the world, saying no to the world's way, and saying, I have something better. 
denying ungodliness and worldly lust, exploitation of others to get what I want. Ran rock, run rock, shot over others to get what I had. Be selfish and self-centered, and I got to be number one. No, denying ungodliness and worldly lust because I'm laying up and I'm only here for the moment. But what God has for me in heaven. He says we deny that, but we should live soberly. That means that our mind, we are alert. We are mindful of the things of God. And righteously, we pattern what God has told us. And godly in the present age that we are in. Why should we do that? <laughs> because verse 13, looking for the blessed hope. Oh, church. We should live this way with wisdom because we're looking for Jesus to come. We're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why should we do that? Because who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Oh, church. The grace of God that brought us salvation don't just stop there. It keeps on teaching us to live by God's wisdom applied to our life. And when we are in the whole counsel of God, God will show us because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine. That's the teaching that we need to know for reproof, for showing us where we're wrong, for correction, for showing us how to get it right, for instruction in righteousness, to show us when we're not wrong, how to live day by day, instructing us in the right way of living, the purpose being that the man of God, that the woman of God, that the girl, the girl of God, the boy of God might be supplied, complete, perfect, thoroughly supplied unto every good work. Oh, church, when we live this way, we are displaying the grace of God. When we do this way, we are displaying the grace of God. And our world needs to see the grace of God. They need to see it, old church, they need to see it in our lives and how we conduct ourselves with them. James said, don't lie against the truth. Don't lie about my brother. Don't say you belong to my brother and you act like you belong to another. Because if you belong to my brother, it's going to affect the way you live. Oh, church, in these last days, those of us who love the Lord, we got to show him living. We got to live it in such a way it's unmistakable that we love the Lord. Because there's too many people, too many people who don't know the Lord. And we want God. As the Bible says, Paul says in Acts 26, to open the eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, to take them from the power of Satan and the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of the power of God, that they might come to know him and find sanctification through him. Oh, church, God has called us to wisdom, and that wisdom should affect how we live. Amen, church? Amen. And when we do that, God will get all the glory and honor and praise. And he will one day say to us, well done, you good and faithful servant. Don't you want to hear those words? I want to hear those words. Amen? 
If you agree with me, and you want to say, Lord, I want to just consecrate myself in you, would you stand as we extend that invitation? Amen.